In 2017, during the process of recording the story of the Mix family with Oscar Mix, we learned from Oscar of the vague and unusual story of a man who in the 1890s was convicted of murder, sentenced to 25 years in prison, and later received a full gubernatorial pardon. Researching this story led us to a quiet corner of the Elk Grove Cemetery and the large family plot of the Springstead and Edgington families. These families came to Elk Grove in the 1860s and were prominent in the area well beyond the 1940s. But the grave marker in this family plot of a man whose name seemed out of place led us to uncover a story like none other yet told in the history of Elk Grove. May 3, 1953, in the front parlor in the home of Mrs. Marie Edgington Phelan at 2226 Capitol Avenue, Sacramento. Marie, 82 years old, has just finished hand drafting a letter and is now sitting at her typewriter beginning to prepare her correspondence. Marie reads as she types. May 3, 1953. Mr. Star Daily, care of the Willing Publishing Company, P.O. Box 51, San Gabriel, California. Dear Sir, It is with grateful heart that I am taking the liberty of writing to you for the great hope, benefit, and happiness your writings have given me. I am an elderly woman, a widow, with no family whatever. The older I grow, however, the more beauty and joy I realize in this life, although many of the lessons are somewhat strenuous. In a copy of the Reader's Digest, I read a condensed article from the life of Dr. Peter Marshall by Mrs. Marshall and was deeply thrilled with the account. I procured copies of her writings and diligently studied them. I noted when Dr. Marshall was annoyed by newspaper reporters asking for an advanced copy of his Senate prayers, you and he prayed over the matter and he accepted and followed your advice. Fortunately, I have obtained a copy of your book, Love Can Open Prison Doors. The experiences you passed through seemed almost beyond endurance. They were miraculous. My parents died in an early age, and I lived on a farm with my guardian and his family, a middle-aged couple with no children, and my life there was rather monotonous. After I finished school, I went to work for a few years then married a mining man much older than myself and worked with him in his office and also in mining camps, acting as timekeeper, bookkeeper, etc. for many men. My husband was an invalid for many years, unable to walk from arthritis, and when he passed on, he left his holdings to me. You are probably aware of what the gold situation has been for the past 20 years, many of the small operators losing their properties entirely. But with change of administration in Washington, D.C., and the better outlook of gold properties, I am hoping for the right disposal of my interest in order to use the proceeds for the needy. May I ask that you pray for my guidance in the matter? I need the tap on the shoulder. I do thank you again and again for the insight you have given me in the power of love, but as yet, however, am unable to entirely grasp Dad Trueblood's method of contacting creative principle through the intermediary of love. I earnestly pray that God will further bless you and protect you in a long life for the holy and wonderful work you are doing. Very gratefully yours, Marie E. Phelan, Mrs. Richard Phelan. Fourteen Sentences Marie's Life of 82 Years stated in a letter with just 14 sentences. A letter written to a man she only knows through his writings. This letter arouses so many questions. How long did it take her to compress her life into such succinct words? What are her interests and gold property? What of her early life? Where did she grow up and what of her guardian family? Did she truly have no other family? Where did she live, and what was her work before she married a mining man? What of this mining man? What were his holdings, and how did he come by them? What of the tap on the shoulder? How could it help dispose of her gold interests? 
May 18, 1953, Cafe of the Sierra City Hotel, Sierra City, California. Just after writing her 14-sentence letter, Marie traveled from Sacramento to her home in Sierra City. Marie is meeting the social reporter for the Sierra Booster newspaper. The reporter has long been interested in writing Marie's biography, and they have agreed to meet and begin the process. You know, it's rather fitting that we are having this conversation while in the restaurant of this hotel. You see, my late husband bought this hotel in 1903 and made it into a grand establishment. But we'll get to that later. I was born August 3, 1871, the third of four children, all born in Sacramento to Levi Clay and Lucinda Edgington. The firstborn was my older sister Laura, then brother Thomas, then me, followed by sister Ida, who was born with physical disabilities. Our parents were both born in Ohio and came west by wagon in 1860 to settle in Sacramento. My father was a butcher. In 1876, we moved to Elk Grove, where my father began a grocery and butcher shop business in downtown Elk Grove. Sadly, a year later, in 1877, when I was just six, our mother died. It must have been very difficult for our father, and I know that a lot of responsibility fell to my sister Laura. But we did well until 1884, when our father suddenly died. I was 13, and everything changed. In his will, which on the day father died, he stipulated to his two closest business associates that each of us three unmarried children were to receive various cash payments with the balance of his estate to be split equally between each of the four children. The biggest part of his estate was a property in downtown Elk Grove. With the settlement of the estate, none of us would be destitute. At the time father died, Laura was married, living in Elk Grove with her husband, Ernest Springstead. They had a two-year-old with another on the way. My brother Thomas was 17 and went to live with Laura and her family. He ran father's butcher shop in town. We thought that my little sister Ida and I had no place to go, but father had arranged for us to live with his good friend Alfred Kaufman and his family. They had a large farm just west of Upper Stockton Road and north of Elk Grove Main Street. Mr. Kaufman was also the executor of my father's estate so I knew that he was a trustworthy man. The Kaufmans had come to Elk Grove in 1875 from Illinois with their two daughters. Both girls were older than I and both married and moved elsewhere shortly after Ida and I arrived. Mr. Kaufman was a prominent wheat farmer in the area and was a highly respected member of the community. While we were safe and well cared for, existence on the farm was fundamental. I went to school in Perkins, Enterprise, and Brighton, while Ida, with her disabilities, stayed home. In 1888, Ida, age 13, died. Her will instructed that I should receive her entire estate, which amounted to some cash and her share of our father's property in Elk Grove. It took a few years to sort out, but in 1890, I received Ida's share of the property which, when combined with my share, meant that I held the east 50 feet of Lot 4 in town. Laura and Thomas later transferred the titles of their shares to me, and I sold the entire property in 1893 for $1,100. In the fall of 1890, when I was 19, with the help and blessing of Mr. Kaufman, I moved to San Jose to attend teacher preparation school. Education was a major interest of Mr. Kaufman, not only for me, but for the entire community, because in 1893, he was the primary force and advocate for creating the Elk Grove Union High School District. Attending teacher school was a very major change in my life. Not only was I expanding my education, but I was living where there was so much happening and with so many interesting people and exciting events. Soon, I was granted a teaching certificate from the San Francisco Board of Education, and I began working at the grammar level. 
Through the years, I came home to Elk Grove often and traveled on occasion to Grass Valley to visit my brother Thomas, who had since left Elk Grove to work in a butcher shop there. I was saddened in 1897 when Mr. Kaufman died in an accident on his farm. Mrs. Kaufman moved to live with her daughter and family in Sacramento, but soon after, they all moved to Oakland. In 1899, at age 28, I added a teaching certificate from the Board of Education of Sacramento County and began teaching grammar school there. I remember in the summer of 1900 going to Soda Springs to camp with Mr. Mead and his family who lived in Elk Grove. I loved the mountains. On the trip with us was my niece Ernestine who was 15 and Mrs. Mead's niece Carrie from Tulare County who was 25 and going to school in Los Angeles. Ernestine and I kept a close relationship from then on. While being in Elk Grove was secure, I missed the happenings of the Bay. So in 1905, at age 36, I gained a teaching certificate from the Board of Education of Alameda County and began working there. Soon, my life would take a dramatic turn. For in 1906, I met a man named Richard Phelan. This man was well known around the Bay and certainly here in Sierra City. He was a man of some repute for business and industry, but also a man with a criminal past. With my sister in Elk Grove and my brother in Grass Valley, both with families and full lives of their own, I had only my own good judgment in selecting a path with this man. And this path I did select. We would marry in 1908 when he was 50 and I was 37. Richard was born in Waterford, Ireland in 1858. His journey to America began in actually 1874 in Ireland with his arrest at age 16 in a pub brawl. He and his older brother Thomas and a friend came to the aid of an innkeeper and his wife who had come under attack from a traveler. The traveler, a man of some magnitude, filed charges and all were arrested. At trial, however, all the charges were dismissed. But soon after, the family immigrated to Canada. Then in 1879, they immigrated to Illinois. The family put down roots. Richard became a naturalized citizen in Chicago in 1880. With his citizenship in hand, he wasted no time and headed to Arizona, where he gained employment as a blacksmith in the Tiger Mining District near Phoenix. Here he learned much about the mining, refining, and smelting business. With this knowledge, in 1882, he determined to head to California, where at age 24, he landed a job at the Selby Smelting Works in Vallejo Junction, just east of San Francisco near Crockett. Here he gained even more knowledge of the mining and processes of the gold business. He worked in the refining room but had to leave because breathing all the sulfuric acid impaired his health. So in 1888, he left the smelting works to own and operate an inn in Vallejo Junction. In 1890, he was granted a liquor license for the place he named Identical Saloon. It was this enterprise which afforded him the opportunity to meet all nature of people coming and going through the junction to and from the gold fields and San Francisco. Not by intent, but it was these connections which set the stage for the grand accomplishments and great fame he achieved throughout the rest of his life. In 1892, when he sold the identical saloon to his older brother James, he began putting together investment ventures in gold mines. It took him three or four years to get things rolling, and he mostly focused on mining ventures here in Sierra County. He was having great success in bringing major investments into the area and had become a prominent figure in the mining and business circles of San Francisco and the Sierra Mountains. These were rough and tumble days in California, but Richard was able to easily move between the rawness of gold mining camps and the fine homes and business boardrooms of San Francisco and even New York. He wasn't a large man, just five foot eight, but his steel blue eyes, Irish broke, and confident manner allowed him to command any setting. 
In 1896, at the Sierra City Gold Ridge Mine, in a dispute between mine owners, Richard was involved in an altercation. He was mine superintendent and was carrying out the directives of most owners when another owner hired some men to stop him. They were to stop him even if it ended him. A shootout at the mine ensued and one man was killed and another made an invalid. Richard was cleared, but a year later, the brother of the invalid man sought revenge and another shootout occurred, this time close to the Hilda mine near here. The man who attacked Richard died in the gunfight and the incident set Richard's life into turmoil. Here, I brought a scrapbook of news accounts which best recounts the events. Look at this headline. Dateline, the San Francisco Examiner, December 19th, 1897. Headline, 25 years in San Quentin. Heavy sentence meted out to Richard Phelan, the mine superintendent at Downeyville. Richard Phelan, the superintendent of the Gold Ridge Mine in Sierra County, was sentenced today in this city to 25 years imprisonment in San Quentin for the murder of Daniel O'Connor. Phelan does not intend to let the judgment of the Superior Court stand in his case, for he gave notice of an appeal to the Supreme Court of California. He claimed all through that he believed there was good cause for shooting O'Connor, who had threatened to kill him for causing his brother James O'Connor, now of San Francisco, to be shot in a duel on the night of December 31, 1896. The owners of Gold Ridge Mine, who live in San Francisco, had been quarreling, and the stockholders split into two factions. Phelan's enemies tried to crowd him out by letting the assessment work for 1896 lapse and then claiming the property at midnight of December 31st. But he went there with his friends and met the representatives of the rival faction. Paul Mueller, one of Phelan's opponents, raised a rifle to shoot him. Phelan threw O'Connor before him and the ball lodged in the man's hip. Instantly, Phelan fired his revolver over James O'Connor's shoulder and killed Mueller. He was acquitted as he acted in self-defense. O'Connor's brother Daniel threatened to get even with Phelan for causing James to be wounded. The men met in October on the trail near the town and opened fire on each other. Phelan was the better marksman for his shot, Daniel O'Connor, through the head. After his appeal was rejected by the Supreme Court, Richard began his sentence at San Quentin on April 5, 1899. But he immediately began to appeal to Governor Henry T. Gage for parole and a pardon. Richard was successful in his appeal and was at first paroled on June 16, 1901, then fully pardoned on January 9, 1903. Here's one of Richard's personal notes on the subject. My conviction was a diabolical frame-up to get me out of the way so as to grab my valuable properties. It did not succeed. The Honorable James D. Phelan, Mayor of San Francisco, aided me financially and influentially in my fight for freedom. But we are not related further than being of the same clan descended from a remote ancestor who founded the name and the clan over 2,000 years ago. My financial debt to Mr. Phelan has long been paid, but there is another that will always remain. Things didn't quiet down easily. Look at these newspaper clippings. While on parole, Richard was unjustly connected to another incident, but the terms of his parole vindicated him. Dateline, the San Francisco Call Bulletin, August 7, 1901. Headline, more than a quarter of a million dollars is stolen from the vaults of Selby Smelting Works in Crockett. Greatest bullion theft of all time and the simplest in execution. Flock of detectives scour the shores and hills of Contra Costa County. Robbers tunnel the building and drill through the floor of the steel vault, reaping a rich and fruitful golden harvest. All the precious metal is taken from the safe, but two bars are left on the rocks beyond the railroad tunnel. Many theories of escape are advanced, and a search is being made for the robbers and the gold brick booty. Dateline, the San Francisco Examiner, August 7, 1901. Headline, Detectives Have Their Eyes on Phelan. 
Phelan was released from San Quentin about six weeks ago upon a petition signed by Mayor James D. Phelan and numerous other San Franciscans. Years ago, Phelan was employed at the Selby Works. Later, he kept a saloon and lodging house in Crockett, frequented principally by Selby's employees. Dateline, the San Francisco Examiner, August 8, 1901. Headline, Skillful and Elaborate Plans of Thieves Who Stole $283,005 from the Selby Smelter. Robbers in Hiding Across the River. Situation Invited Attack by Thieves. Is Richard Phelan the man? What the newspapers didn't know is that Richard's release from prison required him to report his movements to the warden of San Quentin through the sheriff of each county in which he had permission to travel. Such was the case at the time of the robbery. Dateline, the San Francisco Call Bulletin, August 8, 1901. Headline, Richard Phelan, the suspect cleared of all complicity. The crime for which Phelan was sent to San Quentin was murder in the second degree, and there was never any stain on his honesty. Upon leaving San Quentin, he returned at once to Sierra City, where he has been engaged in mining operations ever since. Dateline, the San Francisco Chronicle, August 8, 1901. Phelan's story was fully corroborated by Warden Aguirre. This, however, didn't stop the local newspapers from running a series of inflammatory front-page stories condemning Richard, including exaggerated stories of accusations offered by the management of the Selby Smelting Works, which continued for a year. Dateline, Appeal Democrat, Marysville, August 6, 1902. Headline, Phelan Wants Damages. Interest in the sensational theft of more than $300,000 worth of gold bullion from Selby Smelting Works by Jack Winters last August was revived today by the filing of a suit for $30,000 damages against the Selby Company by Richard Phelan, who demands that sum because of alleged and false and defamatory statements connecting him with the robbery made by Superintendent Vanderrop. Thus ended the notorious phase of Richard's life, and from here forward he focused his attention on picking up the pieces and advancing his business interests. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, March 19, 1902. Richard Phelan arrived in Downeyville on Wednesday's stage from Sierra City. He went up Slug Canyon and took general observations at the Australia Mine, where he has been at work. Preparations are being made for an early start on the Butte Saddle Mine. Richard Phelan, who has had the amalgamation plates resilvered in San Francisco, is having them taken up to the mill and laid in place to be in readiness as soon as the snow is off the ground. Mr. Phelan had intended going east in a few days, but learned that the parties he was going to see there are coming to California. He will await their arrival. He expects to interest them in several Sierra County mines. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, September 12, 1902. Richard Phelan is at the head of the Butte Saddles Mine, which is opened up by a long tunnel. It is expected that much more work will be done there in the near future. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, December 23, 1902. Richard Phelan was a passenger for San Francisco on the lower stage last Sunday. He has purchased John Brown's grocery business and goes to order a new stock of goods. Pat Phelan, Jesse O'Connor, and Sam Langston came down from Sierra City this week and have gone to work on the Alexander Ken Ledge in Slug Canyon, which is being operated under a bond by Richard Phelan. Dateline, the Marysville Appeal. Marysville, September 15, 1903. Last week, Lawrence Golf sold the Sierra City Hotel to Richard Phelan. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, March 31, 1904. Richard Phelan, in addition to the sale of the Buttes Mine, has also got control of the Bigelow Mine at this place. Richard Phelan, with his usual energy and with thorough knowledge of prospects and conditions in these mines, has persistently tried to interest capital and been successful in disposing of the famous Sierra Buttes. Those who know his dogged perseverance in a legitimate cause will rest assured that no efforts on his part will be spared to promote the interests of this 
as well as others mining operations in which he is interested. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, May 9, 1905. Richard Phelan left for San Francisco on Thursday's stage. R.J. McCord, clerk at Phelan & Company's store, went to San Francisco last week. Dateline, The Recorder, San Francisco, March 24, 1906. Mr. Richard Phelan wishes to announce that he has bought out the place located at 534 California Street, San Francisco. Dateline, the Sacramento Bee, August 12, 1907. Richard Phelan, who is promoting the construction of a big power plant at Denton on the Feather River, announces that before the project reaches consummation that a new railroad through Yuba Pass connecting Marysville and Oakland may result. Phelan states that a 10-foot dam is to be constructed at the mouth of Gold Lake and the water pipe down Gray Eagle Creek to the power plant. It is claimed that 20,000 horsepower can be generated in this manner. Here's one of Richard's personal notes on the subject. The deal referred to in the Reno, Nevada Journal was made by Governor Sparks of Nevada in 1907. He introduced me to a representative of C.T. Barney of the Knickerbocker Trust Company of New York who sent engineers to appraise the property and report thereon. They made a favorable report and a deal was agreed upon for two million dollars. A substantial deposit was paid me to bind the bargain, but before the deal was entirely closed the Great Panic of 1907 burst on the nation and Mr. Barney was caught in the crash and committed suicide and the deal fell through. I still retain the quartz and placer properties referred to in the news item. In the appraisement of the radius mines and water rights by Mr. Barney's engineers, the water rights and quartz mines were appraised at $1,650,000 and the Commodore group of placers $350,000. Unable to quickly secure new funding, Richard began selling off the assets of the hydroelectric company. Many water rights, dams, pipelines, and aqueducts were sold to the newly formed San Francisco-based Pacific Gas and Electric Company. As Richard's statewide fame grew, he was interviewed in 1913 by the Los Angeles Times when he was invited to give a presentation of his story to a large audience at the Holenbeck Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Dateline, the Los Angeles Times, August 12, 1913. Headline, gets long sentence. The story of his battle against great odds in a log cabin on a lonely mountain was told by Richard Phelan yesterday. I was superintendent when I learned that some of my associates were in a conspiracy to gain control of the mine and get rid of myself and others outside the ring. This action followed a discovery of a rich strike which had been kept secret. When I entered the cabin, I was met by three armed men. When I stated my mission, they laughed at me and informed me that I would not get out alive. At once after the shooting, I surrendered to the authorities and was discharged at the preliminary trial. Then I found myself to be the object of a conspiracy even more serious, if possible, than the first, a conspiracy of lawyers. I learned too late that the prosecuting attorney and my attorney were brothers-in-law. I was sentenced to San Quentin and after serving 11 months was pardoned by Governor Gage. Dateline, the Los Angeles Times, August 12, 1913. Phelan is president of Sierra Mining and Power Company. He has located gold properties that aggregate to $5 million in value. He says that he has three homes in Sierra City, San Mateo, and San Benito. He came to California from Arizona in 1882. He is an old-time acquaintance of Rawl King, manager of the Holenbeck Bar. Richard kept a constant stream of business ventures in the pipeline. Dateline, the San Diego Union, April 30th, 1916. Headline, Kelp Company plans to operate factory. The Kelp Products Company that is said to have been the first potash manufacturing concern in the San Diego field yesterday filed in the county clerk's office a certified copy of its Articles of Incorporation. 
The plant at Point Loma was leased to Swift and Company for a year. The term is about to expire and the latter company has in the meantime built an extensive plant of its own in Roseville. The Kelp Products Company is stated to be capitalized for $200,000. The directors being E. Blankenberg, Adolph Arts, Richard Phelan, and A.C. Woodboro of San Francisco and Daniel H. Knox of Alameda. E. Blankenberg is the local manager of the concern. It is stated that it is proposed to manufacture fertilizers, potassium, sodium, algin, iodine, and bromine. Throughout most of his life, Richard suffered from severe and debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, such that he and Marie eventually moved out of the Bay Area, hoping to realize improvement in his condition. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, October 1st, 1920. Richard Phelan, a former resident of Downeyville, has moved from Fruitvale in Oakland to Auburn for the winter in the hope that the change of climate will benefit his health. When the expected health improvements did not materialize, they moved back and forth from between the Sierras and Oakland while they continued to manage business interests in the Bay Area and the vast empire of mining holdings in the Sierras. In 1928, back in Oakland, disaster struck Marie and Richard. Dateline, San Francisco Chronicle, October 3rd, 1928. Headline, Fire Destroys Mining Relics. Relics of early mining days in California and irreplaceable mining records of Richard Phelan, miner and prospector, were lost yesterday afternoon when a house owned by him at 2303 23rd Avenue, Oakland, was destroyed by fire. Miss Betty Birch, who rented the home from Phelan, was absent when the fire began. Phelan is bedridden at Nevada City. No one was injured in the flames. Neighbors saw the fire break from the building, a one and a half story shingled frame structure, and called the fire department. The fire had gained much headway before it was seen that prevention of destruction was impossible. The loss was estimated by Battalion Fire Chief F.R. Leahy at $8,500. No valuation could be placed on Phelan's relics, records, jewelry, and other property in the attic. Regardless of treatment methods, Richard's health continued to decline. Dateline, The Morning Union, Grass Valley, April 30th, 1929. Richard Phelan, one of the best known mining men of Sierra County, passed away at Oakland on Wednesday, April 25th, 1929, according to information received by friends in Downeyville. For a number of years, Phelan has suffered intensely from rheumatism. He came to the city to live about two years ago, hoping that the climate would benefit him, but without avail. He bought a residence property on Broad Street, Nevada City, which he greatly improved and made it into a splendid home. Last fall, he went to Oakland for treatment, but his condition did not improve. All through his long illness, he had the faithful care and attention of his wife, who, with a brother, Dennis Phelan, of Sierra City, survives him. Dick Phelan, as he was known to nearly everyone, was a native of Ireland, about 70 years of age. He followed mining most of his adult life and had several properties in Sierra County, some of which are now being operated under bond. Shortly after Richard's death, Marie moved to Sacramento into a home at 2226 Capitol Avenue, where she lived a quiet life while continuing to manage the various business interests including, in 1939, selling the Seattle Buttes and Sacred Mound Mines in Sierra City. But Marie developed other interests as well. During Richard's latter years, Marie began to extensively research medical, dietary, and spiritual remedies to cure his arthritis. After his death, she continued these pursuits, and in the early 1950s, discovered the spiritual writings and preachings of a man named Star Daly. Dateline, Sebastopol Times, January 22, 1953. Star Daly, now a noted lecturer and religious leader, began his career as an underworld character. For 25 years, he lived a life of crime in and out of prison, never having more than a fifth grade education and knowing nothing but degradation and vice. 
For over 20 years, he has been lecturing from one end of the country to the other and has been active in prison reform and rehabilitation of ex-convicts. He has been a leader in the camps farthest out for more than 10 years. The story of his conversion from criminal to evangelist is contained in two of his books, entitled Release and Love Can Open Prison Doors. Marie was so taken by the message of Star Daily that she wrote her 14-sentence initial letter to him on May 3, 1953. On May 8, 1953, Mr. Daly responded. May 8, 1953. Dear Mrs. Phelan, It was nice of you to write and let me know that my books had been a help in your spiritual life. Perhaps many are helped by writers, but few ever let the writers know about it. I'm remiss on that score also. I shall be keeping you in prayer as you seek to adjust the settlements in the best interest of everybody concerned. If it's all done in God's way, it will be well done. May you continue to grow in spirit and faith and grace and feel the tap on the shoulder, as you so aptly put it. Sincerely yours, Star Daily. Who was this man, Star Daily, who had so captivated Marie? Our initial research into Star Daily turned up nothing. In short, he just didn't exist. It wasn't until we read his book, Love Can Open Prison Doors, that the truth began to reveal itself. The book was published in 1933. In chapter 19, titled A New Name, Mr. Daly described how, when he was serving a long sentence for prison escape, a fellow prisoner called the Lifer, who was serving a life term for murder, became his sage and guru. As Mr. Daly was nearing the end of his sentence, the lifer urged him to adopt a new identity upon his release. Mr. Daly relates how the lifer envisioned the new name by helping Mr. Daly interpret his recurring vision of a horizon, a sunrise, and sparkling items in the sky. In the view of the lifer, the vision was conveying his new name, stars rising above a new day. Ergo, Star Daly. Within a year of being released from prison, Star Daily wrote his book describing in detail his life of depravity and then eventual rehabilitation. In the book, he also openly admits that the author's name is a pseudonym, without revealing his true identity. So who is the real author? Our big break came when we located a wedding announcement for a young Southern California woman in which her stepfather, Star Daily, walked her down the aisle. Building on this lead, we were eventually able to determine that Star Daly's real name was William Friesland, who was born in Illinois in 1893. William Friesland was, in fact, in and out of jails and prisons in Illinois from his early teens until he was nearly 40. In 1927, he escaped from a county jail, was recaptured, and sentenced to state prison, where he experienced his conversion and met the lifer. Whether he or the lifer came up with a strategy, it was a stroke of brilliance to craft a new name, attach the life of crime, degradation, and vice to that name, and openly, yet most covertly, live a new life under his real name. Operating under the public persona of Star Daily, he exploited the notoriety of his misguided early life and the story of his conversion to make a living. Mr. Friesland was seemingly a shrewd individual. On May 25, 1953, Marie continued to write to Mr. Daly, who at the time lived in Monrovia, California. May 25, 1953, Mr. Star Daly, 258 El Nido Avenue, Monrovia, California. Dear Mr. Daly, there are times when my command of English is inadequate to express the deep appreciation that some unexpected kindness extended to me has produced. Such is my experience upon the receipt of your most gracious letter. Soon after writing you on May 3rd, I went up to Sierra City, Sierra County, California, where my mining interests are located. During the return trip, a direct thought came to me. There would be a letter from you awaiting me at home. I brushed the thought aside, for at that time I believed you were living in Washington, D.C., 
as I had gleaned from Mrs. Marshall's book, A Man Called Peter, that you visited there with them, and the time was too brief for a reply from that location. In looking over the mail, I was puzzled at the postmark of Monrovia, as I knew no one living there. The surprise, happiness, and thankfulness that overflowed my heart when I read your kind wishes for my welfare, and the remembrance in your prayers for the right adjustment on my business affairs is beyond expression. And also, that you are living here in California. That gives me hope that someday I may have the honor and joy of meeting you personally. I am enclosing a few views that were taken in the immediate vicinity of Sierra City. The elevation there is about 4,200 feet to 8,650 feet. The climate is delightful for about nine months of the year before the snow and cold weather develops. Your experience in the hospital ward and prison is most fascinating. You were truly sent by God as a teacher and healer for those poor, sick souls who had severe and pitiful lessons to learn the hard way. Again, I thank you with the best of my ability and pray for your happiness and great success in all things. Very sincerely yours, Marie E. Phelan. On July 28, 1953, Marie wrote her third letter to Mr. Daly. July 28, 1953, Mr. Star Daly, 258 El Nido Avenue, Monrovia, California. Dear Mr. Daly, Since I first learned about you, obtained a copy of your wonderful book, Love Opens Prison Doors, and received your kind letter stating you would remember in prayer the request I had asked for the disposal of my property, you have been very much in my thoughts and prayers. At the time I first wrote you, a mining man who knows the property very well felt quite positive he would be able to make a deal and would act as the superintendent for the purchasers. He has very persistently worked on the matter, but has met with no success. Although I was born and lived all my life in California, I do not know the southern part of the state as I have been no further south than Fresno. I imagine the section in which you live may be rather densely populated, and I have been wondering if you and Mrs. Daly would not enjoy coming to Sierra County for a visit in the mountains. If so, I would be very happy to have you come and remain just as long as you wish. I live alone in a large house that was built in the early days, 1876, and you can get an idea of how the first settlers lived. In the early days, when placer mining was exclusively followed in Sierra County, the main streams were found to be very rich. The South Fork of the North Fork of the Yuba River, which passes through Sierra City, was worked for a distance of 15 miles from Sierra City to Goodyear Bar and yielded $15 million, thus making an average of $1 million to the mile. After the placers were worked out, attention was turned to the quartz mine, and they have proven equally as rich. A property adjoining mine, the famous Sierra Buttes mine, has paid $17 million, official reports and dividends. My property has produced about $200,000, just enough to prove its richness without being gutted out. I have had it under bond and lease for $200,000. Being well advanced in years, I realize my stay here is of short duration, and so I am anxious to make a deal that will be of benefit to the needy. I have been greatly interested in Apopago Indians of Arizona and would like to help them. The property is absolutely clear of debt, and after looking thoroughly into the matter, if it should appeal to you to handle it, I am ready and willing to give you 50% of it. Very sincerely yours, Marie E. Phelan. Despite her appeals and offers of generosity, there is no record of any subsequent response from Mr. Daly or any further correspondence from Marie to Mr. Daly. Dateline Sierra Booster, Loyalton, October 2nd, 1953. Guests of Mrs. Marie Phelan of Sierra City at dinner at Zerloff's were Madams Jane Barton and M. E. Lambert.
But in December 1954, this story appeared in the Sacramento Bee. Dateline, the Sacramento Bee, December 25, 1954. Mrs. Marie Phelan, 83, of 2226 Capitol Avenue, died early today in the Sacramento Hospital where she was being treated for injuries suffered December 24th when a car struck her on Capitol Avenue near her home. The driver of the car, identified by the police as Mrs. Ifa Gertz of Redondo Beach, said Mrs. Phelan stepped from behind a parked car into the path of her vehicle. Mrs. Gertz was cited for driving without an operator's license. Mrs. Phelan is survived by her niece, Mrs. Bunsmith of Elk Grove. From the turbulent world of California mining in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to prison time and a full pardon, Richard Phelan lived an illustrious life. For Marie, she came from a life of, as she put it, monotony, to live a life of excitement and riches which surrounded both she and Richard. Together they led astounding lives. During their marriage they owned property worth millions and grand homes in both San Mateo and Oakland as well as a cottage in San Benito County and homes in Sierra City and Nevada City. Richard's mining and business acumen not only resulted in the richest strike of gold and silver anywhere in California and Nevada but his accomplishments with hydroelectricity laid the foundation for a system still in operation over a hundred years later. At every turn, Marie was integral to the endeavor in applying her own knowledge, talents, and tenacity. Dateline, the Sacramento Bee, December 28, 1954. Entered into rest in this city, December 25, 1954, Marie Edgington Phelan, widow of the late Richard Phelan, aunt of Clyde T. Edgington of Hollywood, Mrs. Bun Smith of Elk Grove, and Mrs. Beatrice McNulty of San Francisco, native of California, age 83 years. Mrs. Phelan is at the Palm Chapel of James R. Garlic, corner of 20th and P Streets. Funeral and cremation tomorrow morning, Wednesday. There is yet some mystery about Marie's accidental death in 1954, but there is no record of the dailies ever visiting Marie in Sierra County or elsewhere, and no record of a transaction as proposed by Marie to benefit the Papago Indians. What is known is that her niece, Ernestine Springstead Smith, Mrs. Bun Smith, received family artifacts and assets Marie held at the time of her death, as noted in a local newspaper story. Dateline, Sierra Booster, Loyalton, October 14, 1955. Bun B. Smith, husband of Ernestine Smith of Elk Grove, passed away September 25th in Sacramento. Mr. and Mrs. Smith had made several trips to Downeyville of late. Mrs. Smith is a niece of the late Mrs. Marie Phelan, and Mr. Smith was the executor of the Phelan estate. As to the Phelan family, Richard was joined in California by four brothers. James, Dennis, Paul, and Pat. Over the years, they established and operated several mining and tavern businesses in San Francisco and Sierra County. Many of their descendants remain in the Sierras and throughout Northern California. Mr. Star Daily, William Friesland, continued to tour the country with his message of faith and rehabilitation until his death on April 22, 1973, in Riverside, California. The ashes of both Richard and Marie are interred in the Edgerton Springstead plot in the Elk Grove Cemetery. They had no children. With the death of Ernestine Springstead in 1968, there were no descendants of either the Springstead or Edgerton families remaining in Elk Grove. In our next installment, we'll relate the stories of the Springstead and Edgerton families, which represent over 300 years of the American experience. This story is a production of the Linda May May and Lima Foundation and is protected by copyright. To enjoy other stories and get information about the year-round activities of the Foundation, please visit our website at lmlfoundation.org.